John H. Johnson was the grandson of slaves who would go on to start his own publishing company. And from that, he would release Ebony and Jet Magazine. He purchased three radio stations, started a television production company, and a book publishing company, and a few other successful businesses. He was the first African American to appear on Forbes 400 list. So fall back and relax. Let's get into it. John Harold Johnson was born January 19, 1918 in Arkansas City, Arkansas to Gertrude and Leroy Johnson. When John was six years old, his father died in a sawmill accident, so he was raised by his mother who worked as a camp cook. John was enrolled in an elementary school for black students only. The school was not only overcrowded and segregated, but schools for black people only went to the eighth grade. John loved learning so much, he repeated the eighth grade on purpose, even though he passed with flying colors. John's mother remarried James Williams. He was a strong figure in John's life. In 1933, John and his mother traveled to Chicago to visit the World Trade Fair. Chicago was considered a mecca for black people. They moved there with hopes that opportunities in the North were more plentiful than in the South. With that being said, John's mother decided to move there. His stepfather did not want to move, but he did a little while later. Since the South had very few opportunities, they saw Chicago as an opportunity to find better jobs. And for John to continue with his education in high school, as stated earlier, you could not go to high school as an African-American in Arkansas. He first went to Wendell Phillips High School freshman and sophomore year. Then he transferred to DuSable High School junior and senior year. John was subject to a lot of teasing and taunting in high school because they were poor and his country accent didn't help. Most of the students at his high school were middle class. While in Chicago from 1934 to 1936, John and his family were on welfare. In those days, it was called relief. Welfare is not like it is today. Back then, it was just food, no money. Trucks would come to the, into the neighborhood and drop off food only. Some of John's classmates in high school were Nat King Cole, Red Fox, and the future entrepreneur, William Abernathy. John's high school career ended up being distinguished by the leadership qualities he demonstrated as student council president and editor of the school newspaper and class yearbook. He attended high school during the day and studied self-improvement books at night. He graduated with honors and was offered a scholarship to the University of Chicago. He almost declined the scholarship because he could not figure out how to pay for the other expenses besides tuition. Because of his achievements in high school, John was invited to speak at a dinner held by the Urban League. When Harry Pace, president of Supreme Life Insurance Company, also a black man, heard John's speech, he was so impressed with the young man that he offered John a job so he would be able to use his scholarship. John began as an office boy at Supreme Life Insurance, and within two years, he had became Pace's assistant. His duties included preparing a monthly digest of newspaper articles. With help from his publisher, Madame Dubois, John began to wonder if people in the black community might enjoy the same type of service, a monthly digest. His work at Supreme Life Insurance gave him opportunity to see the day-to-day -day operations of a business owned by an African-American man. This inspired his dream of starting his own business. Once the idea of a digest occurred to him, it began to seem like a black gold mine. John stated this in his autobiography titled, Seceding Against All Odds. He remained confident even though he was discouraged from everyone around him. He was turned down from bank loans and any investment capital. The only person that believed in him was his mother, who had a powerful belief in her son. She supported his vision and allowed him to use her furniture as collateral for a loan of $500. 
He used the loan to publish the first edition of Negro Digest in 1942. Harry Pace gave John access to Supreme's 2,000 policyholders. John wrote to the policyholders requesting $2 per subscription. He eventually generated $6,000 from Supreme Liberty's policyholders. His wife Eunice helped him with chores and a wide variety in different areas. His office was a small corner of the law library located inside Supreme Liberty's building. He published the first 5,000 copies of his issue in November 1942. He mailed 3,000 copies to his prepaid customers and gave the rest to a well-known distributor named Joseph Levy. But he was told that African-American publications did not sell so well, so newsstands owners would not keep them. He developed a unique sales strategy. John would ask his friends to secretly go around to different newsstands asking for Negro Digest. The newsstands owners began to think there was a demand for it, so they started to keep the publication on their stands. John would eventually give his friends money to buy all the copies of the journal, which he sold back to the newsstand owners. John used the same strategy in other cities. He used a different strategy in the South. He would sell the magazine in cotton fields, parks, and on buses. Within eight months of the circulation of his magazine, he had reached 50,000 customers. John resigned from Supreme Liberty in September 1943. That same year, John bought his own building and set up his offices. Since Negro Digest was published in digest form and most readers wanted magazines like Life and Look, John launched Ebony Magazine. His wife Eunice gave the magazine its name. The first issue of Ebony was published in November 1945. The magazine was a complete success as the first 25,000 copies were sold out in the first few hours. This triggered John to print another 25,000 copies. Initially, John did not include advertisements in his magazine, but depended solely on subscriptions. But in 1946, John began to carry advertisements. African American models were used in the magazine's advertisements. A conscious effort was made to portray positive aspects of African American life and culture. Everything in the magazine was addressed to African American consumers. John maintained that Ebony's success was due to positive images of African Americans presented in the magazine. In 1951, John launched Tan, a true confessions type magazine. That same year, he started Jet a weekly news digest, and a couple other publications called African American Stars and Ebony Jr., a children's magazine. Although all the magazines achieved a measure of success, none of them as big as Ebony magazine. In its 40th year of publication, Ebony had a circulation of 2.3 million, and the primary reason John was considered one of the 400 richest individuals in the United States and was the first African American to appear on Forbes' 400 list. John's most notable issue of Jet was the September 15, 1955 issue in which he published a picture of Chicago youth Emmett Till's mutilated body after it arrived in Chicago from Mississippi. People consider John's decision to publish Emmett Till's photograph his greatest moment. Congressman Charles Diggs recalled that given the emotions the image stimulated, the issue was probably one of the greatest media products in the last 40 or 50 years. John's company, Johnson Publishing, owned Fashion Fair Cosmetics, the world's number one makeup and skincare company for women of color and Supreme Beauty Products, hair care for men and women. Johnson Publishing was also involved in television production and produced the Ebony Fashion Fair, the world's largest traveling fashion show, which has donated over $47 million to charity. Johnson's Publishing also has a book division, which employs more than 2,600 people with sales over $388 million. John also purchased three radio stations, 
and served on the board of directors of several major businesses, including the Greyhound Corporation. Now that's aggressive intelligence. On August 8, 2005, John Johnson died of congestive heart failure. He is survived by his wife and daughter and grandchild. John Jr., his son, died in December 1981 after a long battle with an illness related to sickle cell at the age of 25. John's funeral was held at University of Chicago's Rockefeller Memorial Chapel, where an estimated 3,000 people attended, including former U.S. President Bill Clinton and future U.S. President Barack Obama and civil rights leader Jesse Jackson. John was buried at Oakwood Cemetery in Greater Grand's Crossing neighborhood in Chicago. In 2019, the Arkansas legislator created a John H. Johnson Day to pay tribute to his legacy and help support a museum in Arkansas City. The suggested date for the day is November 1st because this is the date the first issue of Ebony was published. In that same year, Johnson Publishing filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Former NBA player Junior Bridgman with his company Bridgman Sports and Media bought Ebony and Jet Magazine for $14 million in December 2020. If you would like to hear more of Junior Bridgman's story, please check out our video on Junior Bridgman. He is a former NBA player who was worth $600 million through his business ventures. Well, that's it for Aggressive Intelligence. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. See you in the next.